<laughs> In 2002, 20 years ago, the world was a completely different place. Never mind the fact that Michael Schumacher was just a three-time world champion, or that Tony Blair and George Bush hadn't done some stuff in the Middle East yet. Back in 2002, Porsche only made sports cars. But then, the world changed. The company that brought the world the 911 made an SUV. It would turn out to be one of the greatest left turns in motoring history. But when it happened, oh, Oh, there was outrage. You see, at the time, the only people that really made SUVs in Europe were aiming them at farmers or the military. They were rugged, they were utilitarian, they carried sheep. The Cayenne, well, that was an SUV for the road. It had an interior you were happy to spend some time in. It was a car that Porsche were happy to put its badges on. Very quickly, it became a status symbol. Reception to the Cayenne was mixed. The purists hated it. It was ugly. It wasn't a Porsche, they said. People who had already flown off the handle when the 911 went air-cooled, this time they were apoplectic. But then something strange happened. People bought them. And people bought them and bought them and bought them and then continued to buy them. They bought so many of them that Porsche made another Cayenne and then Porsche made another SUV, the Macan. They made so many, and people bought so many of them, that it made other car companies do the same and meant that today people are happy to buy SUVs from companies that they would never have dreamed of going to before. There are big 4x4s from Aston Martin, from Bentley, from Audi, from Lamborghini. Whisper it, there's definitely soon going to be one from Ferrari. Having completely ripped up the rule book and put the SUV right at the very top of the pyramid with the Cayenne, you've got to ask, why are they making an electric estate car now? The Taycan Sport Turismo is the second estate that Porsche has ever made, and the first electric one. It's fast and it's stylish and we absolutely love it, but why does it exist? It's a hard one to fathom, is this? Porsche is a company that is right at the forefront of automotive futurology, I guess. They're quite happy to take concepts that have worked for years and just throw them away, chuck them in the bin. So why have they built a four-seater family electric car with a big old bum, an estate? It doesn't make any sense. Do they know something we don't know? Are they trying to kill off the Cayenne and the Macan? Does Porsche think that electric technology is the savior of the estate? I don't know. Okay, so maybe the only way we can do this is to look at things rationally. Let's diagnose this decision step by step. Okay, let's start with the way that it looks. Firstly, that arse is so nice you sh probably shouldn't be able to see it on YouTube, it should be censored. And that said, the normal Taycan is a pretty damn good looking car, but make it an estate and we're pretty weak at the knees here. I've always thought that the main problem with the standard Taycan has been where the roof meets the boot. It's kind of like there were two designers designing it and one of them knew he had to get the roof line down to the boot the other one wanted to keep the boot where it was and never could the two meet. Turns out, the solution is to make it an estate. Looks fantastic. There's just a few details I'd like to point out. You're going to start with the shoulder line down here, which is very strong and looks great on the estate. It looks much better on the estate than it does on the normal coupe. And then there's these aero fins, which are carbon fibre and cost about £2,000. But I don't normally like carbon fibre on cars, but those look great. And then there's just the details inside the Porsche logo at the back, which nobody's ever actually going to look at, but they're there. And that's the kind of attention to detail that most of its rivals don't really have. To top it off, round the front, there's that Taycan face, the one which screams 911 of the future, rather than the Panamera's 911 after all the pies. But what about practicality? See, the problem with estates is they need to do estate type things. So you've got to lug things around and all that stuff. And when you make them attractive, it can sometimes cause issues. Take the rather nice Alfa Romeo 156 Sport Wagon, which is beautiful, but has a boot entrance that is about as useful as a Wellington boot is to a ballerina. 
So, how much boot space does it have? And since we at GRNR pride ourselves with giving you the best consumer advice possible, I know what you're thinking right now is, can you fit a small horse in the boot? And the answer, I'm pleased to say, is yes. Hello, Rufus, who's a good boy? In case you're wondering, one small horse is about 446 litres, or if you put the seats down, that's 1,200, or three small horses, if you couldn't do the maths. And that's not all. In the front, there's more. But we wouldn't dream of putting an animal in the front. That, that would just be cruel. Instead, we know that you can fit one motoring editor. Hi, Sean. Hi. So, it does big car things well. But surely that means it compromises on being a Porsche. In short, no. This is not just a new shape for the Taycan, it's a new spec as well. This is a Sport Turismo in shape and a GTS. Just like every single other Porsche in the known universe, there's now a GTS spec that sits right in the middle. So it's not as larry fast as, say, the weirdly named Turbo or Turbo S, but it's also quite a lot more potent than the standard Taycan. This one has 517 horsepower, which is about 130 more than a base spec car. If we step it up into Sport Plus mode, that becomes even more insane. 850 newton meters torque, 600 horsepower on overboost and launch control, which means that if you come to a stop and do this, go! Oh, Jesus! You get acceleration that never gets normal, ever. You quite regularly find yourself in normal mode coming up behind another car who's turning right and slowing down as you would and flooring it and smashing your head back into the head restraint. Probably got concussion after 20 minutes with one of these. It is extraordinary the way that this thing continues to deliver power. With that 850 newton meters of torque, it'll do 0 to 60 miles an hour in 3.7 seconds, which is faster than both the RS6 and the Panamera GTS. Fun fact, by the way, the maximum torque sent to the wheels during a launch control start is 8,800 newton meters. Goodness. Of course, this being an estate, there's extra metal up there. So it is a little bit heavier, but it's only 90 kilograms. And on an original weight of about 2.2 tons, that really isn't making a lot of difference. And the other great thing about EVs, apart from you know the way they deliver power, is that the heaviest bit is the batteries. And they can be put anywhere. So they're all spread out along the floor of the car, which means it's got a nice low center of gravity and 90 kilograms of extra weight at the top really isn't going to change anything. One thing that can't be denied, other than the fact that this thing has a massive ass, is that it's extremely wide. Driving a left-hand drive one, I do feel basically like I'm in every single hedge. And when you're on almost any country lane, passing another car will make you clench. But that just helps it stay planted. And planted is the only way to describe the entire Taycan range. The power delivery, as manic as it is, is all handled really well by the chassis and that four-wheel drive system. It really takes either some horrendous weather or you being an absolute menace to get it to struggle to find traction. And the steering is excellent. And take note, other German car manufacturers, it's a slim, delightful wheel, not a big, fat, chunky thing with 96 million buttons on it. It's just a nice wheel. You don't need anything else. The steering is on the firmer side of heavy, but it is just the way that, like every Taycan, this thing just feels completely planted at all times that blows your mind. In fact, this car feels amazingly like the Cayman 2.0 we drove recently. It's probably the most different car that Porsche makes without being an SUV, so the similarities are striking. There's very little movement from the chassis, but the grip is phenomenal. The whole experience is a little bit like the truest demonstration of what a roller coaster actually is. Because a roller coaster, it's not actually some chaotic way of throwing things around without any control. It's, it's the exact opposite. It accelerates and turns with ridiculous amounts of grip and traction, but no bother. It's your internal organs that are going to be feeling absolutely everything. And it, the car is just getting on with its job. And the suspension manages to gather up 2.3 tonnes of movement incredibly well. But it definitely gathers it up. Don't expect a cushion in here. It's a bit more like those buffers you get at the end of a railway station. The ones that stop the train from just careering straight through the rest of the station. It sorts everything out, 
it doesn't cost at you. And if you put it into Sport Plus mode, you're probably not going to want to stay there for too long or be on a track, because otherwise your head does start to feel a little bit like it's in a blender. The interior? Well, it's lovely. It's a very nice place to be, but we've already done two videos on Taycan, so go and watch it. There's a link somewhere up there. Of course, the handling is helped by this Taycan having rear-wheel steering, although it is perhaps the least aggressive implementation of such a system I've come across. It still helps to get this objectively massive car around the corners. But in case you hadn't guessed, this amount of power, style and handling, and that Porsche badge, well, will they come at a price? I'll be honest, it's £104,000. Yeah, I'll just let you pick, no, actually stay down, because this particular one with its PDCC Sport and its £1,600 red paint and £2,200 of carbon fibre and the panoramic roof and the privacy glass, this one's £131,000, which is pretty much the same cost as a 911 GT3. Ouch, is it worth it? Are the looks, the speed, the portionness, the ability to carry small horses and motoring editors worth it for a combined range of just 260 miles? Oh, it can't be, can it? Oh, but a BMW M5 is only six grand less, and an RS6 is £100,000, and an E63 is about £100,000, and oh no. Does it actually make sense? I'm not sure I can handle a planet where Porsche builds an electric estate car and charges £100,000 for it and I'm okay with it. And have we actually managed to answer the question as to why Porsche is making an estate car in 2022 when it killed the segment with the SUV? No, I don't think we have, I'm afraid. It doesn't seem to make any sense. It makes sense to me. I love this car. I think the idea is brilliant and lower riding performance large car it's exactly what you want but why is porsche making it i guess we just have to trust them maybe the same crystal ball in stuttgart that they looked at that told them that the cayenne would work is telling them that this is what people are going to want one day and if it is maybe porsche and electric tech are the saviors of the estate car and if that's the case, then Porsche will have made one of the most important cars in the history of motoring. Yeah, yeah.